Maybe we're a little biased, but here at Cinefix, we think movies are important. They show us how we could be, they give us role models, and nowhere is that more important than in our leaders. So, we're taking a look. These are our picks for cinema's 10 best leaders of all time. One of the most fundamental aspects of leadership may well be as simple as expertise. Outsiders be damned, how could anyone hope to change the landscape when they don't know the difference between a hill and a valley? Broadcast News' Jane is a badass producer, Hidden Figures' Dorothy is a fantastic mathematician, Sully is a damn good pilot, Black Hawk Down's Hoot is a spectacular soldier, Marge is a brilliant detective, and Captain Ramius is a genius submariner. But we think the best example of this is actually another submariner, the Captain Lieutenant from Das Boot. Immer ruhig, Männer. Das ist noch gar nichts. Unnötiges Licht aus. There is a calm composure to U-96's captain. His leadership is well-worn rather than flashy, betraying an intimate knowledge of his ship, his crew, and his field. So when the depth charges start exploding and everyone starts working in unison on a three-dimensional game of chicken that nobody can actually see, his men must silently depend on his acumen or perish. And we must too. The film gives us no more explanation or perspective than them, limiting us to the inside of the sub, listening to his orders for clues to the narrative, relying upon his experience. We don't have to take his word for it. He never tells us he's the best, but we see it and we know it, and that makes him great. After expertise, there's determination. There's no surer way to get others to hitch their horse to your wagon than to drive relentlessly towards the finish and then arrive, and no surer way to lose them than to promise the world and then falter. Some of cinema's most driven leaders are the likes of Branch Rickey, burning the whole world and everyone in his way down to get Jackie Robinson into the major leagues, Cool Hand Luke, whose unflinching stubbornness landed him a leadership he never asked for, and 13 Days as JFK doggedly pursued de-escalation even when it seemed impossible. Steve Jobs Chris Gardner, and Zero Dark Thirty's Maya all absolutely refuse to quit. But if there's someone who is the definition of unstoppable, it's gotta be Ripley from Aliens. Get away from her, you... When those around her descend into panic, Ripley keeps a cool head and attacks the problem. And once she's started, she just doesn't quit, until there's only one thing left standing, either her or the problem. And it makes her such a natural leader that she is constantly being elected into command, not by vote or discussion or by asking for it, but by a quiet, subconscious accord from everyone around her. Compare her to Lieutenant Gorman, who confuses leadership with issuing lots of orders and dissolves into spaghetti when he is forced to rely upon his own abilities. Plus, she respected the rules of quarantine, and if picket fences had listened to her, everything would have been fine. There's a cliche in filmmaking that 90% of directing is good casting. And whether this is literally true or not, it conceals an underlying fundamental of leadership. Most of it is about building the right team. Nick Fury assembled the best in the galaxy. Leonidas' 300 could take on thousands. The Post's Catherine Graham defended her team when they needed her most. Moneyball's Billy Bean put himself on the line to buy his team the space they needed to change baseball forever. And Danny Ocean knew just the right combination of oddballs to grab the loot. But if we're talking assembling oddballs into something greater than the sum of its parts, we can't pick anyone other than the man who built the team that built the team, Kambe from Seven Samurai. When the villagers didn't have the money to afford even a single samurai, Kambe put together a team of seven. And then, with a soft hand, he turned his crew of wayward warriors, wannabes, and pretenders into leaders in their own right. Recognizing brilliance wherever it was, nipping deadly risks in the bud while ignoring unimportant misbehavior with good humor, Kambe isn't necessarily the best in any single category, but he sure knew how to put people together. And as much as leader assembles a team of misfits is a well-worn cinematic trope, it is because of Seven Samurai in combat. 
Once you've got a team up and running, the next step is a dose of humility, distributing praise while absorbing the blame with the sense that the buck stops at the top. Some of film's best humble leaders are the likes of Dumbledore, George Bailey, and Captain John H. Miller from Saving Private Ryan. But if there is one who stands head and shoulders above them all and then kneels back beneath them, it's none other than Aragorn from Lord of the Rings. This day does not belong to one man, but to all. Let us together rebuild this world that we may share in the days of peace. Aragorn was never in it for the glory or the praise or the crown or the ring, and that's exactly one of the things that makes him such a mythically fantastic leader. With ego out of the equation, there's no room for corruption, self-aggrandizement, or narcissism. He is there to empower others and lift Middle-earth up around him. And in declining the excess praise that might be heaped upon him, he's reassuring others that he's there for the right reasons, which in turn makes them feel confident in his leadership. It creates a powerful and necessary trust between him, the fellow fellowship and all of Gondor, a trust without which their fellowship would surely break. Right alongside humility, we find communication, that ever-important ability to speak wisely and true, to say what you mean and mean what you say, and stand by your word. Who doesn't admire Abe Lincoln for unshakable honesty? Who isn't inspired by the plainness of Charlie Chaplin speaking from the heart in The Great Dictator? Or Coach Carter? But for us, if there's one beacon of inspiration when it comes to communicating with confidence, it's none other than Gene Kranz from Apollo 13. Quiet down. Quiet down. Let's stay cool, people. Procedures, I need another computer up in the RTCC. I want everybody to alert your support teams. Wake up anybody you need, get them in here. Let's work the problem, people. Let's not make things worse by guessing. Thank God Flight Director Gene is as good at the gift of gab as he is because, well, that's basically his job. And as he does it, you trust him almost immediately. There is no bullshit, no sale, no exaggeration, and no padding. But it's not cruel or uncomfortable either. He has a calm command of language and enough confidence in it to speak plainly and true. But it's more than just his honesty. It's also his precision. He speaks in a way that is unmistakably clear, which, when you're trying to coordinate the effort of a handful of astronauts, astronauts, hundreds of scientists, and thousands of technicians is pretty obviously important. If there's one thing the leaders we admire most in movies seem to have in common over and over, that thing is integrity. They show us how a strong leader prioritizes the whole over themselves. They do what is right rather than what is easy. Consider Sir Thomas More in A Man for All Seasons, or Atticus Finch in To Kill a Mockingbird. This is Oscar Schindler, it's Colonel Dax, it's Gandhi. It's Lieutenant Nicholson in Bridge on the River Kwai almost to a fault, and the reason why Paul Rusesa Bagina saved over 1,200 lives. But if there's a leader in cinema who didn't have a single unintegral bone in her body, we think it might just have been Aaron Brockovich. We can get these people. With a little effort, I really think we can just nail their asses to the wall. Oh, you do. With only legal expertise, you believe that? Don't you ever just know? You also just know where the money's coming from. That's why most of these cases settle lack of money. Do you know what toxicologists and geology experts cost? We're looking at a hundred grand a month easy. I've already made a huge dent in my savings. We'll figure it out. I admit, I don't know shit about shit, but I know the difference between right and wrong. Aaron Brockovich is pretty much allergic to doing anything but the right thing, and it probably says a lot about the world we live in that this caused her no shortage of trouble. When faced with insurmountable odds and an honest-to-God Goliath of an adversary, Brockovich refused to let the idea of impossible knock her off her conviction. And this conviction earned her two things. First, it made her unbelievably resilient. By honoring her best principles, she entered genuine alignment with her moral compass that no external force could shake. Second, it earned her permission to step into the role of leader to a community of people who were so mistrustful that they would accept nothing less than the real deal. We all crave a leader who does the right thing, not just sometimes, but every time. It lets us trust that they're ruled by their better angels. It's called principle, and Aaron Brockovich shows us why that matters. One of the most admirable qualities a leader can possibly have is to lead from the front, to give no orders they wouldn't follow themselves. This is service leadership. This is Iron Man and Colonel Moore and General Patton and William Wallace. In another kind of way, it's Cardinal Bergoglio from The Two Popes and the main character from The Last Temptation slash Passion of the Christ. What, uh, what was his name again? But if there's a service leader first in line and first on our minds these days, it's got to be Black Panther's King T'Challa. Wakanda will no longer watch from the shadows. We cannot. We must not. 
We will work to be an example of how we as brothers and sisters on this earth should treat each other. It is with a heavy heart that we pay homage to the one and only King of Wakanda. T'Challa led every charge, he fought in every battle, even if that meant fighting alone, because he knew that his main responsibility as King was not to wear the armor, but to be the armor. Nothing inspires more confidence that it's all going to be okay than seeing your leader choose the front line, and T'Challa chose it every time. And we think one of the main reasons the character inspired so very many of us has a lot to do with the man behind the mask, just as willing to show up on the front lines as the hero he was tapped to portray, Chadwick Boseman embodied the service leadership attitude in every step. Charitable, giving, humble, and kind, he lent support and sympathy while asking for none in return. Gone too soon but never forgotten, thank you for showing us what it means to lead. Closing in at our number three spot, we want to honor those movie leaders that show us the power of fostering unity. Even when it might be easier to build a coalition on divisiveness, this kind of leader knows that antagonizing the outgroup, while good for loyalty, is bad for peace and progress and pretty much everything else. Here we find Professor X and Harvey Milk and Mandela and Coach Herb Brooks and Caesar from Planet of the Apes. But we think the strongest force for unity might just be Coach Herman Boone from Remember the Titans. This is where they fought the Battle of Gettysburg. 50,000 men died right here on this field, fighting the same fight that we're still fighting amongst ourselves today. Remember the Titans isn't a perfect movie, but what it does have going for it is it absolutely peaked Denzel Washington, and we cannot imagine a list of films about leadership without Denzel on it. The man is liquid charisma, he's a thousand leaders all at once, and not just in Remember the Titans. Over and over again in the 90s and the early aughts, nobody had quite as commanding a presence as Washington's. And in Remember the Titans, he employs it in every possible way. Stern and percussive, twinkly-eyed and smirking, he refuses to accept selfishness, he he fosters empathy, and in one of the film's better moments, he invites the boys to step outside themselves and into a grander narrative. He is the unmovable center. He believes in the power of people working with and for and on behalf of each other, and the results, well, they speak for themselves. Narrowing in at number two, one of the most fun skills to watch a cinematic leader wield has to be a wicked high emotional IQ. It helps them to lead, but more often than not, it also engenders compassion within them. And our favorite leaders know how to make that an asset rather than a liability. So if you're in need of some empathy inspiration, look no further than Wonder Woman, or Mary Poppins, or Freedom Riders Aaron Gruel, or Lieutenant Irwin from The Last Castle, or Moonlight's impeccable Wan. They all remind us of the power of genuinely connecting with others. Others, but our favorite, most empathetic leader almost comes without a name of his own. It's juror number eight from 12 Angry Men. Betting you've never been wronger in your life. If you're wasting your time, you ought to wrap it up. Supposing you were the one that was on trial. Well, I'm not used to supposing. I'm just a working man. My boss does the supposing, but I'll try one. Supposing you talk us all out of this and uh, kid really did knife his father, huh? He wasn't appointed the foreman, but subtly, slowly, and even probably against his wishes, the rest of the jurors gradually begin to look more and more to number eight for which way to go. And it isn't because he's loud, or because he's brash, or because he demeans people he doesn't like. It's because he, as a human being, sees them all as human beings, and invites them, where they are, to join him in empathizing in different ways. Over and over, his first instinct is to put himself in other's shoes, setting off a snowball that sees the remaining jurors cast aside their their own initial judgments. And from there, Fonda seeks to understand them, to find their sticking points, and to engage them there. And every time he seems to find his way, with his immense emotional intelligence, exactly to the right part of the conversation that unlocks their resistance. By the end of the day, everyone has followed his lead. And finally, as we finish our list, we saved our top slot for the power of the visionary. More than just a list of tasks, it's the ability to give people something to believe in, a story to tell themselves about what the future could look like, which sounds an awful lot like what we love about filmmaking. It's what got them up on their desks in the Dead Poet Society. It's what made Neo finally believe in The Matrix, what inspired the students in Mr. Holland's opus, and what got thousands of civil rights activists marching across the Edmund Pettus Bridge on their way to Montgomery in pursuit of a more equal to tomorrow behind Martin Luther King Jr. in Selma. When will we be free? Soon and very 
soon because you shall reap what you sow. When will we be free? Soon and very soon because no lie can live forever. When will we be free? Soon and very soon because mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. Here, the line between the man and the character grows particularly blurry and thin, but DuVernay and Oyelowo's spectacular interpretation allows us to pay homage to both at once. In planning this list, we talked about how Selma's MLK could have been at home in pretty much any of these slots, but when we got into where he belongs most, it had to be here. It seems to us that MLK's most revered message, his most memorable speech, perhaps the most famous set of four words ever spoken, was, I have a dream. The man conjured up and believed in a vision so strongly, so loudly, that it enabled millions to see it too. Now, Selma isn't about that speech, doesn't contain that speech, because there was so much more to the man and his story and his message than just that one dream. But his vision is no less on display. And for that vision, thousands walked into a line of violent police twice. But that was his superpower. He could make everyone who listened to him talk see what was in his head, even feel it. He was a starry-eyed radical dreamer with a preacher's elocution and the guts to believe that while the arc of the moral universe is long, it does bend towards justice. Which is why we think that he's one of the best role models of good leadership of all time. So what do you think? Did we leave out any of your favorite leaders? Disagree with any of our picks? Let us know in the comments below and be sure to subscribe for more Cinefix movie lists.